I'm just so uh, grateful to be here. Um, thank you uh, to the Center for Contemporary South Asia, uh, to Leela, um, uh, to Grace, without whom this wouldn't be possible. <laughs> I've been handling all the uh, technical stuff. Um, and basically, in terms of how this time is going to go, um, I'm going to kind of take the better part of an hour um, to kind of give my remarks. I'm going to show you a lot of slides. It's, I, it is challenging to do philology uh, on a PowerPoint, but I'll do my best to, to, to walk you through it. Um, and then uh, when I get through, we can just transition to uh, questions, discussion, comment, um, and hopefully uh, there'll be uh, a lot to talk about as a group. All right. Uh, and I should also say, for anyone who wants to make adjustments, there, will, there are some 50 slides. So if you are having a hard time uh, seeing from where you are, please feel free to move around uh, so that you get uh, a view. So uh, yeah, so the, the title of my talk is Between Sound and Silence in Early Yoga, Meditation on the Sacred Syllable Om at the Moment of Death. And I'm going to talk to you about my book project on the history of Om, as Lila mentioned. I'll focus on areas where this sacred syllable overlaps with meditation in early yoga. As we start, I'll ask you to forget uh, what you know about these cultural forms as they exist nowadays. Uh, in the time period I focus on, um, more than 2,000 years ago, uh, yoga is not a series of postures to cultivate wellness, but rather a technique of meditation to prepare for death. And Om is not yet a global icon of Asian religions, and you see it here uh, in uh, several uh, contemporary Indian scripts, but an esoteric sound known only to religious elites. And as Leela mentioned, sound is a key theme in this inquiry, as it is in uh, all of my work. In examining the entangled histories of Om and yoga through texts, we have to ask how these texts sounded, what their authors thought about sound, and how they used text as a medium to record sonic practices. And here I draw on the work of R. Murray Schaefer, who coined the term soundscape in the 70s to refer to uh, the acoustic environment. And while modern soundscapes are easily accessible through direct observation and recording, uh, listening to the past requires different methods. To reconstruct the soundscapes of ancient India, we rely on what Schaefer calls ear witness accounts in myth and ritual. And our uh, ear witnesses today are Sanskrit texts, detailed codifications of recitation, ritual, and meditation. And silence is also relevant because the interplay of sound and silence gives form to any soundscape. When humans choose silence, uh, writes Philip Peake, one must listen carefully. And as I will argue today, meditation on Om is constructed between sound and silence, and intentionally so. So, our first ear witness is Hinduism's oldest textual corpus, the Vedas. Composed without the aid of writing, uh, these texts about sacrifice are also known as Shruti, what has been heard. And from antiquity up through the present day, the Vedas have been orally passed on in families of priests, the Brahmins. The oldest parts are collections of mantras, formulas, phrases, and syllables chanted in ritual. And Om itself is a mantra. And yet in the performance of Vedic sacrifice, Om is also a technique of recitation, a sound added to other mantras or substituted for other syllables. And there are dozens of different ways to use Om in chanting the Vedic liturgies. And the syllable also takes a variety of forms. Not only the familiar Om with that labial on your lips, but also Om with the nasal, and even a pure O sound. And then uh, other iterations like O, O, Om, where you extend it for multiple beats. That's why it notated in uh, Roman. Uh, with, the, with the three. And so in the technique called the humming, or the pranava, om substitutes for the final syllable of a verse. So a verse recorded in the oldest Vedic text, the Rig Veda, that goes like this, asa no asa dat, 
would be transformed in recitation and is still transformed today in, say, in, in Vedic ritual in Kerala in recitation by adding an extended om of three beats at the last syllable. And so you would get instead, gamat deve pir asano yajishto bar hir asado. And please excuse my uh, recitation. <laughs> uh, I think my uh, interlocutors in Kerala would be uh, <laughs> not impressed. Um, uh, reflecting on the pranava and dozens of other recitational uses of the syllable, Vedic authors in the ancient period gradually constructed om into a kind of monolithic and unitary sacred syllable. And so by the time of the Vedic Upanishads, om is a full-fledged religious symbol representing the essence of the Vedas, the path to liberation, and the universe as a whole. And as the Chandogya Upanishad uh, famously puts it, this whole world is only the sound Om. So as we move beyond the Vedas into formative yoga texts, Om develops new meanings and applications. And so my aim today is to excavate some Vedic antecedents for what becomes the definitive use of the syllable in early yoga, meditation on Om at the moment of death. Uh, but first, um, another word or two about pre-modern traditions of yoga. As Andrea Jain has observed, the most important lesson from the history of yoga is that yoga is contextual and malleable. Yoga has taken many different forms over the centuries, um, some religious, some not, but there have been Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sufi yogas, and now, of course, as everyone's aware, there's a yoga studio on every corner, right, in uh, transnational uh, modern postural yoga. And the goals of pre-modern yoga systems are the eradication of karma and release from rebirth. And the core techniques are asceticism and meditation. And this repertoire seems to have emerged from non-Brahminical renunciatory traditions, most notably the precursors of Jainism and Buddhism in Northeast India around 500 BC. Its earliest practitioners were called shramana, those who toil. And here we have a picture of uh, the future Buddha Siddhartha when he's experimenting with these more extreme techniques before deciding that a uh, middle way would be more effective. These traditions, however, rejected Brahminical authority, along with Vedic ritual and its mantras. So the question arises, how did Om become part of early yoga traditions? Or to put it another way, how did Brahmins contribute to the formation of early yoga? Johannes Bronckhorst denies that Brahmins played any role, except perhaps by coining the Sanskrit word yoga which is first attested in the oldest stratum of Vedic literature. Uh, James Mallinson and Mark Singleton, who incidentally will be uh, visiting for the Contemplative Studies Yoga Week um, next week for a series of lectures, advocate a more nuanced position, suggesting that early yoga emerges from a synthesis of Brahminical and non-Brahminical ascetic traditions. They point to the Brahminical role in composing or compiling key yoga texts, such as the Upanishads, the Mahabharata, and the Yoga Sutra. And I think, uh, as I'll try to show you today, that we can be even more specific about this. The signature Brahminical contribution to early yoga is meditation on Om at the moment of death. So our next ear witness takes us to perhaps an unexpected place for meditation, the battlefield. And the occasion is the bloody and endless war recounted in the Sanskrit epic, the Mahabharata. The general Drona, tricked into thinking that his son has been slain, lays down his weapons and armor, slumps onto the seat of his chariot, and falls into trance. Grief-stricken, he intends to die. In the words of the text, he is yoked to yoga, yoga yuktavan or yoga yukta. And to my ear, reading this passage conveys um, interiority and a sense of silence. As for Drona, after dropping his weapons, he entered into a state of the highest tranquility. Let it be, he said. And having attained yoga, the great ascetic transformed into light. 
With his mind, he approached that ancient person, Vishnu, the Supreme. Raising his face slightly, heaving his chest forward, with his eyes closed, completely composed, he girded his heart with concentration on Om, which is Brahman, or the Absolute, in a single syllable. And having become light, the great ascetic called to mind the Lord of gods of gods, the imperishable, the highest, the mighty. The teacher then climbed up to heaven, which is difficult to reach, even for the pious. So here we see Drona, uh, Drona assuming a meditative posture, concentrating on Om, calling to mind the supreme deity, and then leaving his body, ascending to heaven in a form of light, and achieving liberation. Such is his yoga. And I just love this. This is a, a Mughal illustration um, from a Persian translation of the epic that shows Drona as a yogi meditating at the moment of death. And you can see his enemy springs forward to attack him even as his spirit is exiting uh, through a flame in his head. And it's interesting to contrast here because uh, you know, this picture here, I mean, these of course, are the, 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 the Mughal illustrations from the 16th century, this is much more uh, recent. But nevertheless, uh, this illustration kind of evokes maybe a more literal reading of the passage in the sense that he's slumped on the chariot, he's still kind of dressed as a warrior. Whereas here you see the artist kind of um, taking the cues, right, in, in the Mahabharata and actually just transforming his uh, whole appearance and posture into that of a, of a yogi uh, in, the, in the Mughal period. Peter Schreiner maintains that Drona's death is the oldest and most concrete testimony for what the ideal of yoga represents in the early centuries of the common era. Yoga, Schreiner argues, is fundamentally a technique for dying, a sterbe technique, a discipline for achieving a state of union through death. And it seems significant to me that the exemplar of yoga as a technique for dying in the epic is Drona, who is a warrior by vocation, but a Brahmin by birth. The account of his death may bespeak a Brahminical effort to incorporate diverse streams of asceticism into a yoga system with a Vedic pedigree. So what then is the background for this Brahminical take on yoga? That is, what are the Vedic antecedents if any, for Drona's meditation on Om at death. So as many of you, I'm sure, know, uh, yoga literally means union. It's a noun based on the verb root yuj, to yoke, join, or unite. And yet, as David White has observed, the word yoga in context has an astonishingly wide range of meanings in Sanskrit. And White has shown that the idiom we saw in the Drona passage Yoga Yukta, yoked to yoga, is an epic reflection of the Vedic idea of the sacrificial patron being yoked to his chariot, which is another meaning of yoga in the early Vedic context, so as to ascend to the sun after death. White points out that the frequency of the verb root krum, which means to climb or rise, and is also used in the Drona passage, um, denotes ascent in such contexts. For White, solar ascent on the Vedic model is what he calls the episteme of Indic soteriologies, a formative paradigm for spiritual liberation in Indian religions. And the Vedic evidence suggests that acts of yoking or joining using the root yuj were also ascribed to poets and priests in ritual performance. Thus we find uh, the frequent idiom yoked to the mind, mano yukta, in cases where the practitioner links his mind to a poem or ritual formula. The word for mind, manas, is based on the verb root man, to think, and both are cognate with mantra. And this etymology reminds us that mantra is not only a chanted formula, but also uh, in Paul Tima's uh, etymological translation, an instrument of thought. And so from the Vedas forward, the external utterance of a mantra is always linked with the internal activity of silent thought. Consider the Jaimaniya school of Samaveda, which Michael Witzel has localized to an area corresponding to modern Gujarat and Rajasthan. 
This lineage has expertise in chanting a type of mantra called a saman, or melody. As I've argued in earlier work, the Jaiminiyas were instrumental in constructing Om as a sacred syllable, uh, most notably in their prose work entitled the Jaiminiya Upanishad Brahmana, which discusses singing with Om to gain immortality. I call these Jaiminiya teachings a soteriology of sound. In modern scholarship, the JUB, as I'll abbreviate this text, has actually received very little attention, surprisingly so for a, a Vedic text. But as I'll try to show you, a close reading of this neglected work sheds new light on later, much more celebrated texts, uh, such as the Bhagavad Gita and others. So one myth tells how the gods escape the specter of death, mrityu, ascend to the sun, and become immortal, all thanks to a single syllable. Om, the text reads. Together they climbed onto this syllable. And then when humans try to emulate the gods, death protests and uh, imposes a condition. Humans may become immortal only after giving up their bodies to him as his share. And the focus of the JUB is a chant uh, from the Vedic sacrifice called the unexpressed Gayatra melody, the Anurukta Gayatra Sama, also known as the bodiless melody, the Asheriram Sama. So it, it allows the patron of the sacrifice to basically shed his body, escape death, and climb to heaven as the gods have done on the syllables of this song. To perform it, three Assama Vedic priests sit at the edge of a round pit that represents the sun and which Vedic authors call the path to heaven and the opening of the sky. And one thing to note is that in Vedic cosmology, in some, some visions of, that, of the cosmos, the sun is not uh, simply a burning orb, but it's a, a, a hole in the solid vault of the atmosphere. So really what you're seeing when you're looking at the sun is like a peephole, right? That, that, uh, that kind of shows you the world of light that's beyond. So this is assumed in, uh, in you know, formulations like this. So sitting cross-legged on seats of grass, gazing to the east at the rising sun, the lead priest undertakes a series of actions that's called the yoking or yukti. Masato Fuji, uh, who's one of the few uh, current scholars who's um, working on this text, describes the yukti as a kind of mental concentration in preparation for singing the chant. The relevant passage reads, then the lead priest saw the song of praise stretched out in the atmosphere, intensely shining. He also saw its yoking. After sitting down for the chant, he should do thus, breathing out, and also thus, breathing in, with the voice. He should wish to see with his eyes. He should wish to hear with his ears. Spontaneously, this song becomes yoked to the mind. So notice the expression here, mano yukta, which describes the transformative effect of the yukti on the priest. The song is now yoked to his mind. And then comes the actual performance of the song. And so after a prelude, the lead priest sings the main section in one breath. The lyrics are a sequence of non-lexical monosyllables called unexpressed or anirukta sounds. And I, I won't try to sing it, but I'll just say what the words are. Uh, ova, 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 humba, ova. Jaimaniya authors treat this pure O sound as an alternate form of Om. Because remember, at, in this period, Om is still under construction as a syllable. There's some, still some fluidity in the, in the form it takes. Indeed, uh, O is one of the most common variants for Om in the Vedic liturgies. The syllables are called unexpressed because they're substituted for an underlying verse. And so as he sings the meaningless syllables out loud, the lead priest reflects with his mind, manasa, on the lexical words of this verse. Pava manayendava abhidevamiya. 
basically he must sing one thing, right, those syllables that I, I mentioned before, out loud, and then think another. So the sound of chanting intertwines with the silence of what we might call a kind of meditation. And, and I'd suggest that we think of this as an early form of mantra meditation involving Om. And this performance uh, is known for its soteriological effects. Climbing on the syllables, like the gods, the patron sheds his body, ascends to the sun, and gains immortality. Another section of the text gives more detail. Uh, when he reaches the threshold of the sun, the bodiless patron submits to an interrogation by the sun god, sun god um, Aditya. And only after he passes this ordeal can he enter heaven or the world of Brahman. And here, Om serves as a password of sorts. As the text says, with Om, he is released into this very sun, which is a hole in the sky. So, like yoga, the word yukti derives from the verb root yuj, to yoke or join, which, as I've mentioned in Vedic texts, denotes the yoking of gods, chariots, poems, mantras, implements, and so forth. And as the Jaimaniya example shows, yuj and yukti are technical idioms of Vedic ritual that denote getting ready for performance. And I'd suggest that this usage may inform later uses of yoga as a practice of yoking the mind to ascend to the sun after death. And more concretely, elements of the Jaimaniya yukti, seated posture, visualization, concentration, control of the breath, attention to the senses, recitation of om, strongly resemble contemplative practices in early yoga systems. This soteriology of sound fits a pattern that has been called the interiorization of sacrifice, a late Vedic shift from external action to external contemplation. And it, it may be obvious, but because we don't really have um, paintings from this period, I've taken the liberty of occasionally just substituting evocative images that come from a much later time period, such as this one, a diagram of the chakras. This inward turn is evident as well in the uh, Chandogya Upanishad, which is a Samavedic text belonging to the Kautama school. Influenced by the Jaimaniyas, who are also Samavedic specialists, Kautama authors develop their own soteriology of sound, in which the practitioner contemplates Om at the moment of death, leaves his body, and ascends to the sun. The section of interest to us links physiology and cosmology, positing a connection between the channels, or nadi, of the heart and the rays of the sun. A dying man ascends along this route, but when he is rising up from his body, he advances upward along those same rays. He goes up with Om. No sooner does he cast his mind than he reaches the sun. This is the door to the farther world, open to those who have the knowledge, but closed to those who do not. The idiom uh, manas kship, to cast one's mind, obviously refers to some kind of mental activity, perhaps a technique of silent meditation, or else some combination of sound and silence is intended, mental concentration on the audible chanting of Om, perhaps. There's just not enough context in these kind of esoteric speculations to say for sure. This is followed by a verse that offers an early reference, perhaps the earliest, um, to what later becomes known as the yogic or subtle body. 101, the channels of the heart, one of them streams up through the crown of the head. Going up by it, he reaches immortality. The rest, in their ascent, spread out in all directions. So the aim here is to turn inward, recognize the self, Atman, which abides um, in, the, in the space within the heart. And from there, the practitioner sheds his body and travels up along these cardiac channels through the head. These channels then merge with the rays of the sun and he reaches immortality, the world of the absolute or Brahman. 
And this same verse uh, occurs in a watershed text in the history of early yoga, the Katu Upanishad. This text presents the oldest set of yogic rules or yoga vidhi and codifies yoga as a technique of controlling the mind in order to achieve liberation. It tells the story of a young Brahmin named Nachiketas who visits Yama, Lord of Death, to learn the secrets of immortality. And again, I've t been kind of, you know, uh, taking the liberty of using a comic uh, here to, <laughs> to illustrate that encounter. Um, having renounced wealth, ritual, and worship of gods, Nachiketas is portrayed in the text as an ideal Brahminical ascetic. Yama Vivasvata is the son of the sun, Vivasvant. Born mortal, Yama was the first human to abandon his body at death and blaze a path to the world of immortality. And now he lives up in the highest heaven. And so the implication is that Nachiketas must ascend to heaven to put his questions to this solar deity, to Yama. Yama tells Nachiketas that to escape death, he must recognize the divinity of the self by meditating on Om. The Atman is the primeval one, Purana, whom the practice of yoga reveals to be a deity, Deva. Again, the path leads through the heart. In Patrick Olivelle's translation, finer than the finest, larger than the largest, is the self that lies here hidden in the heart of a living being. This knowledge leads in turn to realization of Brahman. And the key to the practice is Om. The word that all the Vedas disclose, the word that all austerities proclaim, seeking which people live student lives. The word now I will tell you in brief, it is Om. For this alone is the syllable that's Brahman. This alone is the syllable that's supreme. When indeed one knows this syllable, he obtains his every wish. And so Yama here is just revealing a kind of a, a shortcut, right? Uh, a, the single word or pada, Om, that encapsulates the millions of syllables that are in the Vedas and grants every wish. The Katupanishad also addresses a technical aspect of meditating on Om, calling the syllable the best and supreme support, or alambana. And this is quite valuable in these kind of texts because, again, there's a lot of spe heady speculation, but not always, the, the concrete details are often assumed but not expressed. This, speaking of Om here, this is the support that's best. This is the support supreme. When one knows this support, he rejoices in Brahman's world. So notwithstanding these innovations, I think we can see continuities here with older texts. Again, we find the key elements of Om, meditation, transcendence of death, recognition of the self, and ascent to the sun. But, but again, what does it mean exactly to meditate using Om? Is it an audible contemplative practice? Is it a silent one? The kata is not clear on this point. Om hover, hovers once again between sound and silence. Moving forward in time, the contemplative use of Om gains traction in later Upanishads, which attest a practice of meditation using technical terms based on the root dhyay, so the, which means to meditate. The Svetashvatara Upanishad, for instance, defines the discipline of meditation, dhyana yoga, as contemplating Om in order to see God. A sage in another work, the Prashna Upanishad, asks, Sir, if some man were to meditate on the sound Om until his death, what is the world that he would win through this? And I, I often think of this question when I'm frustrated at the progress I'm making in my book. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be a decent world. Um, all right, so, so let's turn now to another influential text of early yoga from around the same time. And this, is, um, this text needs no introduction. It's the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of the Mahabharata. In the section of interest to us, Krishna, the avatar of the god Vishnu, instructs the warrior Arjuna in a contemplative technique for negotiating death to achieve liberation. The yoga practitioner, yogin, 
or yogi should focus his mind on the highest purusha, the divine person who resides within, described in the text as the primeval poet, the ruler, teenier than the atom, founder of all, inconceivable in form, sun-colored, beyond the darkness. The diction here uh, certainly recalls the epithets used to describe the Vedic Atman. Anticipating the end of life, the practitioner draws on devotion, bhakti, and yoga power, yoga bala. With mind not moving at the time of death, yoked by means of devotion and yoga power, forcing his breath between his eyebrows, he attains that purusha, supreme and divine. The specification of guiding breath to the area between one's eyebrows recurs in later yoga texts, as we'll see in a few minutes. Next, in a verse echoing the Katupanishad, Krishna alludes to Om as the imperishable, or the akshara. What the Veda knowers call the imperishable, what ascetics enter into with passions drained, what people seek leading student lives, this word I will proclaim to you in brief. In slightly more concrete terms, the praxis consists of control of the senses, mind, and breath, leading to concentration or dharana through yoga. Shutting all the gates of his body and confining his mind and his heart, keeping his breath in his head, absorbed in concentration through yoga. And, and once he achieves this state of trance, the yoga practitioner is ready for the last liberating step, the quiet utterance of Om while thinking of Krishna. Uttering Om, Brahman in a single syllable, and calling me to mind, this is Krishna speaking, when he sets forth, leaving his body, such a man goes along the highest path. So what does this sound like? Again, I'm asking these, these questions. The vocal register uh, known as uh, japa, which means murmuring or muttering, and takes various forms from quiet sound to outright silence may be intended here. Uh, Angelica Malinar makes a case for close parallels between this section of the Gita and the Yoga Sutra, where japa is the prescribed technique for chanting. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are the most celebrated pre-modern systemization of yoga. As Philip Maas has argued, the sutras and the detailed auto-commentary were likely compiled by a single author in the third to fourth centuries of the Common Era under the title Patanjala Yoga Shastra. The Yoga Shastra codifies contemplative practices aimed at cognitive refinement, samadhi, leading ultimately to isolation or kaivalya of the supreme person, purusha, from the materiality of phenomenal existence or prakriti. The text is theistic in its focus on the Lord, Ishvara, the divine source of yoga. Influenced by Sankhya metaphysics, renunciatory asceticism, and Vedic orthodoxy, the Yoga Shastra is a deeply syncretic text. Yet according to Mallinson and Singleton, the agency of Brahmins is clear. Quote, the Yoga Shastra represents a Brahminical attempt to appropriate yoga from the Shramana traditions, end quote. So we might expect, on that basis, we might expect that the work would integrate a mantra-based soteriology into the overall system. And indeed, the Yoga Shastra does codify a mode of mantra chanting with a Vedic pedigree. And here we're back to japa, murmuring or muttering. Japa can take a range of forms from sound to silence. Uh, it includes muttering mantras in a low voice, upanshu, that is audibly, but in such a way that no one understands. And if you've seen a puja at a, a Hindu temple, you might have a, a sense of what this sounds like. If you're like, what is, what is he saying? If you're a Sanskrit student like me, you're always wondering and you can never <laughs> follow along. It's very quick. Um, as well as a mental manasa form of chanting in which neither the tongue nor the lips move. According to Vedic authors and commentators, the quieter forms of japa are much more powerful. 
For its part, the Mahabharata elevates japa further and stresses its interiority and importance to liberation. As John Brockington has argued, the epic approach to japa offers a link between Vedic practices and the devotional practices of muttering God's name over and over and over again. And Krishna himself attests to japa's supremacy when he announces in the Gita, of all the sacrifices, I am the sacrifice consisting of japa. So in the Yoga Shastra, two sutras prescribe japa as a technique of mantra meditation for worshiping Ishvara. The pranava verbally signifies the Lord. Murmuring the pranava leads to realization of its meaning. And the pranava here denotes the single syllable, om. Since japa comprises various registers of recitation, from muttered to silent, the mode of chanting again remains ambiguous. And even the you know, extensive commentaries on the Yoga Shastra don't really take a position on the kind of aesthetics of this performance exactly in kind of terms of sensory modality, what the volume is, you know, can you hear it, these kind of questions. The text calls the um, pranava the verbal signifier or vachika of Ishvara. And yet the pranava here has a ritual instrumentality that transcends ordinary language. It's a tool for bringing the practitioner into closer contact with the deity, analogous to the use of Om as a support for meditation in the Katha Upanishad. The auto commentary observes that prolonged murmuring and meditation on the pranava guides the practitioner towards a one-pointed consciousness that confers liberation through direct cognition of the Lord and the Supreme Self. And the Vedic and epic accounts that we've looked at so far are alike in conceiving of yoga as the union of practitioner and a divine entity, God or the self. But the, and the, and the, uh, in this vein, the early modern commentator, Vijnana Bhikshu, sees Patanjali soteriology in the same terms, equating aloneness, kaivalya, in the Yoga Shastra to the non-dualist goal of uniting the individual self and the supreme self. But most classical and current interpretations of the Yoga Shastra take the opposite view, suggesting instead that the supreme goal of Patanjali's system is the separation, the yoga, of Purusha from Prakriti, right? To kind of become disembodied, right? To kind of unmoor the uh, ethereal spirit from the stuff of existence. And this disjunctive liberation has an abstract quality. So in this text, we find no mention of the moment of death, although I would argue that it's implied in achieving that kind of liberation. We don't find any mention of solar ascent or any of the vivid imagery and diction of Vedic and epic accounts. Nevertheless, I, I think the contours of the older paradigm are evident, chanting Om as a form of meditation with the aim of achieving liberation. All right, in our, our last text for today, and I thank you so much for your attention and patience. I know it's a lot of material to go through, um, which is the Maitri Upanishad. Om continues to link sound and silence, life and death, inside and outside, the body and the cosmos. Out loud, the practitioner chants Om along with other mantras. In silence, he meditates on Om. And as the text says, Om is indeed the sun. Meditate on this and unite the Atman. Meditation on Om reveals the liberating knowledge of the undivided self. He becomes a yoga practitioner and a sacrificer into the self, Atma Yajin. The Maitri gives an especially detailed account of how this technique intersects with the anatomy of the body. And once again, ascent is central. The one who is the higher and lower deity, the om syllable or omkara by name, the soundless, the completely void, let the practitioner meditate it on, it on it there in the highest place. According to the commentator uh, Ramatirtha, this refers to the avimukta, which means unsurpassed, but refers uh, anatomically to the space between the eyebrows. And this recalls, I think, our uh, Gita passage of forcing the breath between the eyes. 
And a simile evokes this upward trajectory with the, this beautiful image of a spider rising. Now, just as a spider, having risen up by its thread, arrives at open space, in the same way, indeed, this practitioner of meditation, having risen upwards by means of the syllable om, attains complete independence. And I would just point out, just anecdotally, in my experience, spiders are pretty silent when they're <laughs> going through this motion. Um, Another section explains a technique called higher concentration, para dharana. So again, we're having these kind of these, this diction recur again and again, and authors are playing with it uh, in new ways. And this entails pressing the tip of the tongue against the palate in the back of the throat, controlling voice, mind, and breath. Now, it has been said elsewhere, the channel called gracious, which conducts the breath, goes upward and is split in the middle of the palate. By means of this channel, which is yoked with the mind, the om syllable, and the breath, the practitioner should climb upward, turning back the tip of his tongue on the palate and dissolving the senses. The physiology assumed here echoes the Chandogya Upanishad, which, as we saw above, mentions the channels that connect the practitioner's body to the rays of the sun. Moreover, the diction evokes the emergent system of the yogic subtle body with its central channel, or sushumna, that conducts breath, or prana, upwards from the heart to the head. And anatomically, I think this probably refers uh, to the pharynx, where the carotid artery runs alongside the windpipe before branching upwards, you can see it here, um, behind the palate towards the brain. For the authors of the Maitri, this is a nexus where the faculties of respiration, speech, and thought unite in a very literal and anatomical way. By curling his tongue back and pressing on the soft palate at the back of the throat, the very place, incidentally, where the vocalization of Om begins, if you say Om, you will feel it. You'll feel that uh sound that you know, fires with the attack of sound and breath. The practitioner establishes a kind of physical juncture of breath, om, and the mind. And once the central channel, sushumna, has been yoked, as the text has it in this way, it's possible, uh, so the thinking goes, to dissolve perception entirely, unyoking the senses and their objects uh, from his consciousness. And this is the embodied form of liberation described in the text and called total isolation. So here we have another kind of echo of the uh, Patanjalian term, kevalatvam. And yet, um, in maybe classic non-dualist uh, fashion, this isolated state leads ultimately to union with Brahman, as everything seems to do in this discourse. Um, having first mastered the flow of air and fixed it on the palate, having crossed beyond the shore, then let him unite, again we have that uh, verb root yuj, with the boundless in the crown of his head. So, what does this all add up to? I think that through these passages, we can trace a genealogy of meditating on Om at the moment of death, spanning more than a millennium from Samavedic uh, soteriologies of sound in the later Veda to mantra meditation in the post-Vedic Upanishads and the Mahabharata and other texts. And my analysis of these Brahminical sources, I think, shows the emergence of a systematic mantra-based soteriology with these elements. Seated posture, control of the breath, the senses, and the mind, recitation of Om, uh, sometimes along with other Vedic mantras and syllables, and in various registers, chanted, murmured, silent, death and or shedding the body, the physical body that is, to take on an ethereal form, ascent, often uh, using the verb root crumb to the sun, encounter with the solar deity, realization of the self, Atman, as a transcendent entity linking the individual practitioner with the deity or the cosmos as a whole, recognition of that great deity or the absolute, 
Brahman, and finally attaining liberation, which is variously discussed depending on context as immortality, union with the divinity, escape from rebirth, and so forth. And the activities and goals within each of these elements, as well as the transitions from the one element to the next, and the sequence as a whole, are more often than not characterized in terms of yoking, joining, and uniting, usually with cognate words derived from the verb root yuj, yukti, yukta, yoga, and so forth. These yokings, and by extension, the very ideal of yoga itself in these early contexts, almost always aim at the union of opposed pairs of sensory modalities or metaphysical states, sound and silence, inside and outside, expressed and unexpressed, mortality and immortality, practitioner and deity, and so on. More broadly, this genealogy sheds light on how Om became part of early yoga traditions, at least these ones. Since Brahmins composed, adapted, or compiled all of the works we've considered, it is no surprise that Om, a single syllable that conveys the efficacy and authority of the entire Veda, emerges as the decisive soteriological instrument. And one might even say that the syllable serves here as a kind of sonic icon of the Brahminical brand, signaling the Vedic uh, bona fides of these currents of early yoga. This remains true as the trajectory of Indian religions turns inwards, favoring internal contemplation over external sacrifice. And even in works that prefer asceticism to ritualism, the power and prestige of Om carry weight and continue to. And that Om is a mantra a sacred utterance occupying this kind of liminal aesthetic space between thought and expression, between sound and silence, smooths this historical transition from chanting to meditation. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and thanks again. I know it's a lot to absorb, um, and it is a philological argument, um, but hopefully maybe now, uh, if you guys have time, we can unpack this a little bit. Please.